Hello, everybody. Welcome to Worship Today here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Litchfield Park, Arizona. We're glad you're here. Today we gather around the Word of God. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're still looking at um, how Easter and its victory impacts us every day. And we're going to take a look at one way that um, in theology the gospel is described. We're going to learn a word called divine monergism. It's God's one work. And it puts the highlight and the emphasis that salvation is God's doing in our life. It's not our doing. We're passive. God is the active one. The opposite of divine monergism would be synergism, where you cooperate with God. And so we're going to take a look at the differences between those two and how Scripture would teach us um, that divine monergism, God's work, in his son Jesus is what rescues us. And to prove that, God raised his son from the dead on the third day. Everything in the Christian faith always goes back to the resurrection. The cornerstone of our faith is that Jesus lives, that he really is the son of God, and he is the savior of the world. He has done the work. He doesn't need us to help him. That's our theme. We'll see you in worship in just a minute. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who dared for all the world atone. He is the
Hello, everybody. We begin our worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. With humble hearts, let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, and for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today is from Exodus chapter 6, the first eight verses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians were enslaving. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Our New Testament reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, 
the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And our gospel lesson for today is from Matthew chapter 19, beginning at the 16th verse. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young men said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come then, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, and they asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The strength of the Lutheran Church, of course, is its doctrine. It's theology that focuses our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ and his work of salvation for us. The gospel of Christ is what started the Lutheran Reformation 500 years ago. And it, what, and it is what continues to distinguish us as conservative Lutherans even today. For the past 500 years, Lutheran theology has been summarized by these simple phrases, grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. We hear them frequently. They're part of our theological vocabulary, but they are much more than just simple words. They confess a fundamental truth about Holy Scripture. They teach us about divine monergism. Divine monergism is a term that means God's one work alone. It's a way of saying that God does all the work of salvation for us on our behalf and without any help whatsoever from us. Divine monergism means God's one work alone for our salvation. The opposite of divine monergism, God's one work alone for our salvation, is called synergism. It means that you cooperate with God in order to be saved. Synergism would teach that you have a role to play in salvation, a work to do in order to be reconciled with God. And if you don't do your work, then you are not saved. As conservative Lutherans, 
we reject synergism as a false doctrine. We hold to divine monergism, God's one work alone for our salvation. We hold to that. We confess that because that is exactly what the Bible teaches. Here are some examples from Romans chapter 3. We hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And in Galatians 2, it's emphatic. We know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Works of the law is synergism. You're doing something to cooperate with God for your salvation. These verses and a hundred other ones clearly teaches us that God does the work of our salvation. Jesus said today in our gospel lesson, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God is the active one in our salvation. We are passive. God is the subject of all the verbs of salvation. When you think about divine monergism and God's one work alone, there are a lot of different doctrines that intersect with it to help clarify it and teach it to us. For instance, original sin. The doctrine of original sin means that we are dead in sin, as St. Paul said today in our scripture lesson. We're not just bruised in sin. You're not just weakened in sin, but the Bible says that you are dead in sin. What that means is that when it comes to spiritual things, you have no understanding and no ability whatsoever on your own. You're dead in sin. That's why we cannot cooperate with God for salvation. That's why we cannot do anything to, to reconcile ourselves with God. We're dead in sin. There's nothing we can do. We are dependent 100% on God's one work alone, divine monergism. Think about the word grace. In scripture, the word grace teaches us about divine monergism, God's one work alone. Remember that grace is that biblical term that means gift. Salvation is a gift that God gives to you. It's not a payment for something that you have earned. It's not a reward or an achievement that you have, that you have assisted in and cooperated with God for. Salvation is a gift from God, not a work of man. Salvation is by divine monergism, by grace, and not by our own works, not by synergism. A similar idea is found with the biblical word faith. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit in you through the word of God. Faith is not your decision, nor your desire, nor your acceptance, nor your invitation to Jesus. Faith is, is not a business deal that you make with God. Faith is a gift from God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit through the word of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2 today, it summarized it, didn't it? When it said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
In Scripture, there is another word that captures all of this. There's a special word for God's love that highlights his work alone for us. That it's his sacrifice that saves us. It's the word agape. Agape is a Greek word for love. And specifically in the scriptures, it's primarily used first and foremost for the love God has for us in his son, Jesus. God's agape love is sacrificial and it is giving. It's not a, a mutual love between us and God, like, like the love of friendship. It's not like a love of being in a family. There's another word for that. It's not the love of a husband and a wife. That's not our relationship with God. Rather, agape love is objective, and it comes from outside of us. It's God's love for us poor, miserable sinners, where he takes the initiative and rescues us because there's not a thing we could do to save ourselves. Agape is the Greek word that describes God's love for us in Christ. And one of the things that it does is that it highlights divine monergism, God's work alone in our salvation. You were saved by God's great love for you, by grace, through faith, in Christ, and not because of one thing that you have done. Salvation is by divine monergism. It's God's love for you. It's not you cooperating with God. It's not synergism. One of the benefits of divine monergism is that it gives you absolute assurance. This is an important aspect. You can have 100% full assurance that you are saved because the work of salvation is dependent on God and his son Jesus and not on you. Can you imagine if salvation was dependent on us? What if your eternal salvation was dependent on you? How would you ever know that you did the right thing? How would you ever know that you've done enough to cooperate with God? How would you ever know that your motive was 100% pure and righteous every moment of every day of your life? If salvation depended on us and something that we do to cooperate with God, then you would never have assurance. You would never have confidence. You would be so frightened of death and dying and final judgment. You know these things are true. You know your own heart. You know how far you have fallen from God's perfect and holy requirements. It doesn't take much for us to realize that salvation could never be dependent on us, that we could never cooperate with a holy God to give ourselves eternal salvation. It has to be dependent on God. And it is. God sent Jesus to do all the work of salvation for you. He is 100% holy and righteous at all times and in all things at every moment of every day of his life. Every moment he perfectly obe obeyed the will of God the Father. His one work alone is what saves you from your sins and gives you eternal life. He is the one who said, it is finished on the cross. God's not waiting for you to cooperate. He's not waiting for you to do anything. The work's been done by his son, Jesus. It is finished. So today you can have rock solid assurance that you are saved. 
you can be 100% confident that you will survive death. You can be absolutely certain that you will rise from the dead on the last day. This assurance comes from divine monergism, God's one work alone for our salvation. Knowing and trusting that it was Jesus' work that rescues us and never our own. When you think about this assurance and about God doing the work of salvation for us, there are three places where he works on your behalf to give you this salvation and to assure you of your eternal life. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the first place. The gospel is the power of God that gives salvation. And it assures you that your sins are forgiven. You've heard the words of absolution before. You've read the verses about forgiveness. Someone has talked to you about forgiveness before. You know how powerful those words are to give you peace in your conscience. That's what the gospel does. It's God assuring you that you are saved, that he's done the work. The gospel is the word of forgiveness in Christ. The gospel is absolution, the formal announcement, the proclamation of the gospel to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or to use today's term, your sins are forgiven because of divine monergism, God's one work alone. And that work was his son Jesus and everything he did for us. The gospel, whenever you hear it, not only gives you salvation, but it builds you up and it gives you that confidence and conviction and assurance that you are saved. The word of the gospel teaches you God's one work alone. The Lord has given us a second place also, and that is holy baptism. To give you salvation, he has washed your sins away with his powerful word in the waters of baptism. And now, as we live throughout our lives, we can look back to, to our baptism for the assurance of salvation. Baptism is like a perfect tense event. It's something that happened in your life and the effects are ongoing and continual forever. You can always look back and remember what God has done for you and the effects are still in effect. You still are saved, you're still forgiven, you still have eternal life. Holy baptism is God's one work alone in your life where you were born again of water and the spirit and brought into the kingdom of God. Jesus intentionally uses the term born again because he wants you to think about your first birth. He wants you to remember that, that when you were born, your mother did the work and you didn't do anything. So now in your second birth, it's the same way. God does the work and you don't do anything. That's holy baptism. God is giving you the gift of life. You were passive in both births, your first one from your mother, your second one in baptism by God. In holy baptism, you are washed clean with the water and the spirit, and you are given eternal salvation. You are to look back to your baptism to remember what God has done for you. It would be similar to how the Israelites looked back to the great Exodus event and remembered God's great love and care for them and, they were, and that they were God's people. You can look back to an event like that. You can look back to your baptism, divine monergism, where God worked in your life to give you eternal salvation. And its power wasn't just for that five minutes that your baptism took. It lasts throughout your life. Think about baptism in the perfect tense. Something that happened and its effects remain throughout your life. 
Finally, there's a third place where the Lord gives you this assurance of divine monergism, and that's Holy Communion. When you come up to Holy Communion to take and eat and take and drink the very body and blood of Christ, you are given the benefits of his sacrifice on the cross, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And in that process, you are assured and your faith is built up and you're given a deeper conviction of your salvation. Holy Communion is God's one work alone in your life, where you take and eat and take and drink the bread and the wine, and in the process, you receive the very body and blood of the crucified and risen Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. The crucified and risen Savior is there in Holy Communion for you. He's doing the work to forgive your sins, to give you eternal life to assure you of the resurrection of the dead on the last day, and to abide with you throughout your life. Holy Communion is not only giving you eternal salvation, but it continually assures you of eternal salvation. Today, as we think about our salvation, a term that's important to know and remember and understand is divine monergism. It's a good summary of Lutheran theology. We are saved because of God's one work alone. We do not contribute, we do not assist, we do not cooperate with God. It's his work that saves us. Or as our Lutheran forefathers phrased it, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. Amen. Join together in prayer. Holy Trinity, we thank you for the work of salvation that you have done on our behalf. We thank you so very much that it is not dependent on us and our effort, work, or merit. Strengthen our faith in your grace and mercy and give us firm assurance of our eternal salvation. For your grace, mercy, and salvation, we praise and thank you. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great week. See you in worship next week. My only hope is Jesus. Through his blood he shed for me. Though the earth pass away, this truth will remain. My home is heaven, my healing is the cross, and my hope, my only hope, is Jesus. And I will savor the hope in the grace he gives to me. I will seek the hope for all eternity. I will show the hope to those who have not seen, so others can declare triumphantly my only hope is Jesus through his blood.
my hope, my only hope is Jesus. And I will share the hope with the lonely and the lost and support the hope no matter what the cost. I will shout the hope, Hosanna to his name. With the choir of heavenly hosts proclaim, my only hope is Jesus. Through his blood he shed for me. Though the earth pass away, this truth My healing is the cross, and my hope, my only hope, is Jesus. 